so. Brian, do you need a little more time? Are you good? Oh, you got it, okay. Great, all right, well, welcome, welcome everybody. This is gonna be uh, a lot of fun. What I'm gonna do first is just tell you, uh, in case you don't know, have never heard of Petrocelli or in case you've never been to our winery, um, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of our family history and uh, then I'll introduce Jenna and Monse and we'll move into the, the wine and cheese. Um, so of course, hopefully everybody's got a little glass of wine with them and uh, their cheese is out and ready to go. So Petrocelli Winery was founded by uh, my grandparents, uh, Giovanni and Giulia Petrocelli, just 95 years ago, this July, we're celebrating 95 years of them signing the papers for the property. Uh, the Petrocelli Winery is located in uh, Dry Creek Valley, near just west of the town of Geyserville by a couple of miles and situated within Sonoma County. So where if you look at Sonoma County as a whole, we're actually Dry Creek Valley is the Northwest corner um, of the county itself. And uh, we're the smallest of the four major Appalachians. So my grandparents picked a great spot. Uh, it's a, a lovely area for Zinfandel, Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, which we're having Cabernet today, and a lot of other varieties grow. We, we actually uh, started with an original 25 acres of Zinfandel. Uh, I'll remind you, my grandparents, 95 years ago, it was still prohibition, right in the middle of it. And they bought a shuttered winery, a home, and about 25 acres of vineyard, mostly Zin and a few other varieties, uh, basically a field blend uh, at the time. And uh, they were able to keep that uh, selling grapes during prohibition. We didn't have a, a license to make sacramental wines, but we certainly had uh, the ability to sell the grapes, and that's what kept the vineyard going until repeal rolled around. Whoop, I got a couple more folks joining. There we go. And so uh, when repeal rolled around, then my grandparents uh, and their family started uh, making wine. And we've been doing that ever since. Uh, of course, Zinfandel is our base. And then lots of others uh, joined the fray. We now have farm 11 different varieties over uh, about 100 acres. So that's, that's our size now. And our winery size, we make, oh, about 50,000 cases, uh, which uh, people go, wow, that's a lot of wine, but that's actually puts us at the big end of small, as I always like to say, you know, we're not a, a million case winery. We are, we're a winery that, you know, we, we keep everything kind of close to home. Uh, for the most part, we're a state with just a few of our uh, local friends and growers within just a few miles of the winery. So we're very regionally located. So um, I think, Everybody uh, has joined us who is going to join us. And I want to, uh, again, give you that background for the winery. I've got a couple of, um, uh, my dad is joining. So you'll see Jim Petrocelli at some point along the way. Kathy, my sister is here joining us today. Uh, of course, I, uh, I'll introduce Monse and Janet and uh, Marcus Cano, who is going to be our digital uh, marketing associate. So welcome aboard and uh, so, well, without further ado, I'm going to um, give a little introduction um, as, as so we can get into that first sip of wine and the first taste of cheese. Uh, and this is an open session. So uh, as we go along, I know we're going to have time at the end. I'm going to share a few memories, but we're going to save that for a little later. We want to get through the wines and cheese first, and then we'll go from there. So Jana Fletcher, I... Um, came upon her uh, a few years ago, many years ago. Uh, I've collected her cookbooks. I've uh, been to a couple of her seminars. And if you ever want to know about cheese, I highly recommend Janet. She, she writes a weekly newsletter and is always full of great information about uh, cheeses uh, grown here, made here in the United States, as well as Europe and, and across the world. So it's always fun to, to read that. She is a writer, she is a, uh, a blogger, she is a teacher, and, uh, and again, it's just a pleasure to have Janet here today to talk about uh, the cheeses that she paired up with four of our wines. And um, I, for Monse, 
uh, what we're going to do, I forgot to say, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to, I'll introduce Monse and then she's going to talk about the rosé. And then Janet will talk about the, um, the cheese that she paired up with the rosé. So we'll go, we'll go from there. Janet, did you have anything to add before I introduce Monse? Uh, no, just that I will, I, before we start, I will say a few words about how I pair, you know, what, what I'm thinking of when I pair wine and cheese so that, yes. um, and also I know people are going to jump ahead because they're probably hungry, but um, don't eat all your cheese, like with the rosé, don't eat all the first cheese because you might want to try it with some of the other cheeses, I mean with some of the other wines, okay? Right. Save, save some of your wine, save some of your cheeses so you can try multiple matches. Rosé. Great. Thank you. Okay, so you'll do that when you talk about the cheese, or did you want to say that now? Uh, no, let's go. Let's hear from, uh, let's, let's meet Monse. <laughs> All right. So Monse is our winemaker. She has been um, working with uh, our wines since 2007. She became winemaker in 2015. And uh, we, uh, one little his historical fact is we've only had three head winemakers in our 95 year history. The first was my grandfather. The second was my uncle John, who had the lion's share of vintages. And now Monse is uh, our, our a woman and a winemaker. And so she's uh, from Spain and uh, she came over here. I, she'll tell you a little bit about herself, but she came over here, fell in love with California and stayed. And we're so happy that she did because uh, the wines that she makes uh, have her own special stamp on them. And uh, I know that you will enjoy all of them tonight. So Monse, if you would like to start talking, uh, just introduce yourself a little bit more and then uh, go ahead and start talking about our 2021 Rosé. Well, uh, welcome everybody. I'm Monse and thank you, Julie, for the presentation. That was wonderful. Uh, like she said, I'm from Spain and wine and cheese are, wow, is, is what we love there too. And I think we're going to see some cheeses here that I'm very familiar, especially the Manchego, so I can't wait to get there. Um, uh, about Pedroncelli, this is a, a, a place, uh, it's not just a winery, it's, it's, it's a piece of history in Sonoma County and it's just an honor to be able to work with the Pedroncelli family and be part of this world. It's, it's, just, um, it's just a blast, has been a really, really good experience and I look forward for the future to continue making wines with them. Um, for the Rosea, that's the wine, first wine that we have. If you have it in your glass, this wine is made of Zinfandel. And I have to say that this is makes uh, honor to the tradition of Zinfandel uh, winemaking in uh, Peroncelli. And the, I can I have to say that the rosé is one of the hardest wines to make, and the reason is because um, it's made of Zinfandel, and Zinfandel wants to be big. It's a grape that has a lot of sugar, it has a lot of color, and we try to tame it in the winery. We try to make it lighter. They are to make a low alcohol. This is below 14% alcohol. And it has very, very nice flavors because Zinfandel is a very fruit forward wine. But at the same time, because we pick this very early in mid August, and uh, it has a very crisp acidity. I'm looking forward to try this wine with, this, uh, with the goat cheese that Janet brought us for us, because I believe these two, this wine and the, that, Good cheese have a very big personalities and they're gonna complement very well each other. So I I wanna hear more about that cheese, but I think it's gonna be a really, really good pairing. If you wanna start with yeah, that cheese. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, you know, it, let me just say a few things about what I'm thinking about when I try to find the perfect cheese for a certain wine or the perfect wine for a certain cheese. I would say that my number one principle my driving idea is that I'm trying to line up the intensities. So if I have a light, fresh Chenin Blanc, you know, I, I'm gonna pair it with something that's very light and fresh. And then as you move up that spectrum of intensities in the wine, as you get more oak or more tannin from a red wine, uh, you know, more structure, more, more concentration, um, you can go with bigger cheeses. So that's why I tend to put more aged cheeses with red wines, not 
always, but uh, that's kind of what I'm trying to do is to line up that intensity. But another thing I think about sometimes is just the occasion, the moment. For example, when are you gonna drink this rosé? You're not gonna have it probably with, um, you know, a big crown rib of roast at Christmas dinner. You're not gonna have it before the fireplace in the winter. You're gonna have it in the summer when it's warm and and maybe you're having an aperitif or an aperitivo or a little, uh, uh, you know, collection of hors d'oeuvres. It's the start of the evening. You want something kind of simple. Uh, you've got your antipasto platter. That's when I want a rosé like this, which, by the way, Monsi, is just wonderful. I love that strawberry. I get a lot of strawberry aroma, um, yes. strawberry and raspberry, cherry. It's very fruit, uh, fruit driven. And um, and it's cold, it's refreshing. So I'm going to serve some cheeses with a cheese with it that I think is kind of a start of the evening cheese. And that's this wonderful, you got this um, jar of sheep and it's that it's it says sheep and goat cheese i don't know how they get away with that label because normally we put the main ingredient first and it's actually more goat milk so it's goat it's really a goat and sheep cheese it's in a mix of olive oil and um a vegetable oil i'm not sure whether it's like probably soybean oil that's so it doesn't uh, stiffen up in your fridge uh, when it gets cold and as you can see it's got peppercorns and and thyme, and as you could probably taste, it's got a little bit of garlic in there. So it's a marinated cheese from Australia, where marinated cheeses are extremely popular. There are many, many of them in the, in the grocery store, and this is the number one brand by far. And you'll see why. It is absolutely dreamy. It is so creamy. In Australia, it's 100% goat's milk, but when they decided to introduce it to the US about 12, a dozen years ago, they added the sheep's milk to make it more creamy because we Americans love creaminess. And also it just made it a little different from the other marinated goat cheeses that are in our markets. So I, I think it's really special. I love uh, how they balance those flavors. It's not too, you know, it's not too peppery. It's not too herbaceous and it is so creamy. So I, you know, I love to spread it on a, you know, on a crouton, on a piece of toast. I mean, Australia, they have, they make, for breakfast, they have avocado toast with this cheese on toast, a little piece of avocado on top. Um, sometimes I'll put like in the summer when the tomatoes get good, I'll <clears throat> spread it on toast and add some cherry tomatoes, some warm cherry tomatoes, some roasted tomato. And what a moment to have this beautiful rosé. So I, I hope, um, what do you thought? I'm seeing some comments. Yeah, they dab it behind your ears. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, and the thing is, do not throw away that oil. There are, you know, like seven or eight cubes of cheese in there. When you finish the cheese, I mean, I do serve the cheese with a little bit of olive oil of that oil drizzled over it, but you may still end up with some oil. So save it, put it in your salad dressing, put it in, you know, spoon it over some fish. Uh, or steamed vegetables, like, you know, steamed broccoli. It's an absolutely delicious condiment, that oil. So, yeah, what else would you all do with it? Is polenta, a little bit on top of polenta, I could see. Yep. Yes. Yeah, speaking, it's, as we speak Italian. So, and Julie, by the way, I don't know if you've ever, you must know this even better than I, that, um, your grandparents are part of this amazing wave of um, Swiss Italians and Italian Swiss who came to Northern California and really started the wine industry here. Yeah. I always thought it'd be so fun to get you all together and have a tasting uh, with some uh, Swiss and Italian cheeses because you you know you really have this wonderful heritage um, in, yeah. in Northern California. That would be wonderful. Yes, I agree. That would be a great opportunity to really showcase. Yeah. Italian Italian Swiss colony is just about three or four miles north of us, um, and that was really what was the center of bringing the wine business to California. Honestly, it started. It it really blossomed because of Italian Swiss colony. Yeah, and, and you know, for the, I think. That was like the, the wine I first had as a, you know, as an 18 year old when that's when you could drink at 18. No, you must have and only been about three, Janet. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> you, you must have only been about three years old because. <laughs> yeah, that's, it, what, you know, there's that's a, what we had yeah. a professor, we had a professor come from St. Mary's College come and talk about the Italian influence on the California wine industry and the, the insights that she gave to how important this little part of Sonoma County was to the greater California wine industry. It was just amazing. Yeah, it's, yeah. you know, I drank that Italian Swiss colony for the longest time without ever wondering what is an Italian Swiss colony, right? And it, it, that, it was one. I mean, they have kind of like a commune and mm -hmm. They and you know one person brought over their cousins and then their sisters and they were they had kind of a utopian vision. Um, they did. For, it was it's wonderful history. And they really so trained. They really trained both sides of the wine business, both the wine making side and the viticultural side. So the immigrants that came learned to trade and then invested locally, and that's you know and there there begins the the wine industry. Yeah. yeah. So I, I love that very people are commenting on the cheese. This is by far the youngest cheese we're having today. It goes, yeah. it's made very quickly. Oh, and I wanted to tell you, because um, this is important. This is our only farmstead cheese. Farmstead means it's like an estate wine where you have your own, you're making wine from your own grapes. Farmstead cheese makers are making cheese from their own milk. So this creamery has all their own uses only their own milk and their own sheep and goats and they're not small any longer they've been so successful so it's a there's a large farm in australia um in uh, meredith i think is the name of the area uh, mm -hmm. family owned and um, it goes into those jars when it's about three days old so mm -hmm. super young just sucks up that delicious marinade and i hope you'll uh it's very reasonably priced whole my whole foods always has it and mm -hmm. uh, i hope you'll uh play with it all summer with this rosé and you know, find ways to use it. I'm just gonna add one more little um, historical note about our rosé. We have been making our rosé from Zinfandel since the 1950s and we, we've targeted about 1954. We know we were making a rosé before then, um, but I believe that was when Zinfandel ended up on the label. So you are tasting something like the 67th vintage of rosé out of Zinfandel from Petercelli. And it is, uh, again, what we started with, what was there in the vineyard. So when my grandfather and uncle looked around, it said, well, rosé out of Zinfandel sounds great. So we, it's, it's very much a tradition for us um, uh, over all those decades. All right, well, are we ready to move on to our, uh, I believe Merlot is going to be our next wine in the lineup. And the uh, cheese, I love the name of the cheese. Well, of course, now I can't remember. <laughs> Sorry. That's right. That's right. I should have. Yeah, I should have. Which is going to be really, I'm really looking forward to trying this combination. I actually snuck in a little bite of it with the rosé to see how it would go. And it went really well with the rosé, too. But... Here we go. All right, Monse, would you like to talk a little bit about our Merlot? Absolutely. So this is a 100% dry creek Merlot that we, we grow uh, the vines on the bottom floor of the valley. So the floor of the valley has a lot of deep in the soil and that gives a lot of fruitness to the grapes. So this is a very fruitful one Merlot. The good thing about Merlot is that it's a very versatile wine. It's a wine that goes literally with any dish that you can think of. You don't have high tannins like in, in other wines. You got a lot of fruitness coming. You got plums, you got blackberries, you got some type, a uh, little acidity, some medium body type of wine. I think it's the, the wine that should be more popular just yes, because of that, because of the whole versatile uh, aspect of it. And I, I'm very thrilled that you, Janet, matched this with the mancha uh, manchego cheese because this is the cheese that i grew up with mm -hmm. i didn't have cheddar until i moved to the u.s i never taste any many other cheeses until i moved here but uh, manchego was my cheese and that's what it was in my house and um i think manchego is a very nutty type of uh, cheese and i think goes very very nice with this uh, merlot i think they complement each other and I think those light, light tannins that it has uh, 
make it more savory. I think it's a great combo that you make here. And I'm, I'm sure what it, uh, even if it's very smelly because that's very manchego for you, um, I hope you will enjoy it. I think it's a great, great pairing. I'm really glad you put it with Emma Pro. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I adore manchego uh, in you know all the sh um, Spanish and Italian and French sheep cheeses. This is from the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. And it's actually, although they call it Cabra, they call it Cabra La Mancha. Um, so they're clearly kind of making reference to Manchego. There's a La Mancha goat. Um, yeah. But it's, it's not, it's not, it's not Manchego. It's from the U.S. and it's from goat's milk. Whereas, you know, Manchego is yeah. from sheep milk. Um, yes. And it's, um, and it's more moist than a typical Manchego would be. And as you can see, um, it's got this, this kind of pinkish rind. I'm picking it up because it's, um, it's sticky. And that's typical of this kind of rind, this sort of um, pale salmon colored rind. This is bacteria primarily, uh, not the mold that's on the outside of a lot of cheeses like a brie. This is bacteria mostly. And, it, and they get it by washing the wheel repeatedly with brine, with salt water. Mm -hmm. And good bacteria love that salty, moist surface and so they settle on the surface and you and they and it's the bacteria that are making this cheese so aromatic if like me you took it out of your wrap which i hope you did and maybe i had suggested that you put a cover over it i just put a little um tupperware over it when i lifted that tupperware off oh man i mean it's so beefy and kind of garlicky and funky there's just no other word for it this is a this is our stinker and it's actually a little bit stinkier than it usually is in my experience i think it, this kind of cheese being kind of semi-soft and you know, it still has some moisture it does not love being in that vacuum pack that yours came in and it's just not where it wants to be it wants to breathe and so um ideally you'll take it out of that vacuum if you ever buy it you know this way again take it out of the vacuum and rewrap it in something like um a wax paper or cheese paper if you can get that coated cheese paper and then put it in your tupperware and it will um, stay better that way so what i always do when I, I get a cheese in a vacuum seal like the ones we've got today is i will take a knife um, if you're you know if you're looking at your piece and you haven't done this you're going to see it's kind of glistening on the outside it's a little shiny um from that uh from that vacuum packaging take your knife and just scrape it the back side of the knife you know the dull side and just uh, scrape it until you don't see that sheen anymore and you're gonna release just release that outer film and it's like having a fresh pour of wine in your glass you're gonna release the aroma you're gonna get rid of any oxidized character that was on the outside any kind of stale character you're going to have fresh teeth. So I did that with all three of the hard cheeses. I've done it already. All of the cut surfaces, I'm just going to scrape a little bit. It's called facing the cheese because this is the, the cut part is the face and you're facing the cheese. You're just kind of freshening up the face. So you're not taking off very much, just a little bit. So this, um, let's taste this washed rind goat cheese from Accident, Maryland. It's, um, it's not Farmstead. They buy their milk. They buy their goat's milk from neighbors, from Amish farms, actually, in the area. Oh. Um, Accident is in Western Maryland. I had to look up why it was called Accident. I had to know. And it's because uh, this, this town, this little village, um, was established back in the, uh, I think it was like the 1700s. Maybe before that. It was a land grant that the King of England gave to this gentleman in Maryland because he owed him a debt, he owed him money, and he told the Maryland guy that, uh, that he could uh, uh, he could have 600 acres, any 600 acres he wanted. So the gentleman hired two teams of surveyors, engineers, and he said, go find me the best 600 acres in Western Maryland. And they both, they didn't, the two teams didn't know about each other, but they both came back with maps that had outlined almost exactly the same 600 acres and that, and so he called it accident. 
uh, like, you know, coincidence, accident. And um, so it's still accident, Maryland, where this comes from. And it's going to be um, China. Mm, I just get this kind of beefy aroma, very meaty, beefy. Super smooth. Do you eat the rind? I do, and I suggest that you do. It's meant to be eaten. It's perfectly edible. It's just what was, you know, the salt water and what was in the air, the bacteria in the air that settled on it. So the cheesemaker has been breathing those bacteria for the last three months. This is a three month old cheese roughly. And so yes, it's perfectly safe to eat that rind. And it gives you a little bit of a crunch. It's a little stronger near the rind. So if, if you're sort of borderline about this cheese, that's a little strong for you, you might want to stay away from the rind. But I love it. And it's an example of how with a, a red wine that's got a little, even though the Merlot is not tannic, mm -hmm. we have a little more, a little more to deal with in terms of um, heft than with the rosé. So I wanted to bump up the bump up the cheese. A great it's a melt really fruit. good pairing, yes. Mm. yes. I find it's a little milder for a manchego that I'm used to. Yeah. But uh, I, I really like it. So thank you. I'm not even sure, despite the name, I'm not sure that that's what the, that they're even aiming to make a manchego. I'm not sure why it's, they gave it's, it that You name. cannot do it, yeah. Uh, yeah. Manchego cheese is from La Mancha, and the, yeah. the ships are, uh, the ships are uh, pasturing wet fields, no grass, green grass. So that's kind of where their specific uh, flavor comes from. Yeah. But it is similar. It's pretty close. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, everybody? I said, how many like think this is just too strong for them? They're not loving that funky aroma. Anybody want to wave a hand? Okay, I see a thumbs up. <laughs> okay, yeah, these washed rind. This is this style is called washed rind because they wash the outside with brine, and you get that you get that funk. It's just some people call it um, dirty socks, <laughs> uh, you know. And it's surprising how that can still be very to me, very appetizing, very appealing. Um, even though in, in the morning when I smell the wrapper, like I put the wrapper in my um, garbage can, when I come in in the morning for breakfast, it's not very appetizing, but for dinner it certainly is. And I just think it's a great red wine cheese. It's a nice white wine cheese too. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it wants the fruitiness of the rosé, but it um, it's good with white wines as well, kind of strong mm -hmm. white wine. Yeah, I could see this as going with um, like our Sauvignon Blanc. I think that it, it would be a good match. The Chardonnay might be a little bit too light, but the Sauvignon Blanc really has a little bit more what I would call character to it. So if I were to say, hey, go with the Sauvignon Blanc, that's what I, for a white wine, definitely. Yeah. So and, I think of the cheese for, um, uh you know like platters of salumi where you have some kind of other strong flavors going on i think it would be a nice cheese for that i also put it on a cheese platter at the end of the evening when we're you know we've had the main course and then we have a cheese board and i want some kind of you know stronger cheeses monster would be similar oh and i want to mention i do want to mention a couple of things um, those of you who bought the cheese collection, you know that as I, you know, I, I emailed you and told you you were getting two cheeses that weren't in the original collection because of supply issues. So this Cabra La Mancha is one of them. And the cheese that I initially intended to pair with them, this Merlot, I hope you'll look it up. It's because it's, an, it's a um, Spanish goat cheese that I adore um, from the Catalonia region. I'm going to put it into the chat. It, it's um, an interesting... Uh, Spelling. It's in the Basque uh, Garrocha. Oh, yes. I don't know if you can say it better than I can. Yeah. How would you say it? Monster. Garrocha. Garrocha. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> do you know that cheese? Um, do you know this cheese, Garrocha? Yes. And yeah. This is uh, from the interior of the Catalonia. I'm from Tarragona. I'm in the south of Barcelona. I'm in the coast of uh, Catalonia, but this is the interior. And, and it's, it's, it's very popular for that type of cheese. Yeah, I'm very glad you mentioned it. That's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and the other cheese that you didn't get because they didn't they ran out of it, um, but you got the Meredith Dairy instead, which is actually a little more, 
more expensive cheese, so you kind of got a deal. But um, I'm going to type in the name of the cheese that I initially paired with the um, rosé, which is Snow Frisk. And this is a, a real discovery for me. It's um, my local supermarket has it. Whole Foods has it. It's in it's in a triangular tub, and it's uh, from Norway, and it's a goat cheese, a very creamy goat cheese. They add some cream to it, so it's it's just luscious and a great. Um, if you're looking for another cheese, you might want to try with the rosé. Take a mm -hmm. take a look for Snow Frisk. You're going to fall in love. Wonderful. All right. Well, are we ready to move along? We've got the Cinema Classico next. So uh, we'll have uh, we'll Monse give a little background on that. And then, of course, the cheese that's going with that is um, going to be Janet's wheelhouse. And uh, enjoy the Classico as we go along. And uh, I'll just going to give you a little visual. Often people ask, how do you describe Petrocelli wines, especially our red wines? And uh, since we've got three of them today, I'm going to talk to you about this. I, I was on a, um, during the pandemic, I was on a call with a restaurateur in, in Chicago and he gave me this idea, so I'm gonna take it over, but I love it. Uh, he said, when I taste your wines, I get this. When you were young, maybe your grandmother or your auntie or somebody went like with your cheeks, you know, you're so cute. That's what our wines do. Our wines give you that little bit of grip across the palate. And uh, I'm just gonna leave you with that as you taste, you taste the Merlot, you taste the Classico and you taste the Cabernet Sauvignon, but keep that in mind because that's kind of the little stamp that we have on the wine. So I wanna say Sonoma Classico, please. So our next wine is the Sonoma Classico. This is the red blend um, that we make here at Petroncelli. It's um, it's a Merlot-based blend. So it goes pretty similar as the Merlot that we just tasted. Uh, but this blend has Merlot, uh, Syrah, Sangiovese, and a little touch of Sinfandel as a main grapes. There's a little smaller four varieties in there, but it's very small quantities. The, the philosophy behind this, this wine is a very fruit friendly wine. It has very small oak treatment, spends in barrels about 10 months, no much, uh, with pretty much all very old barrels that doesn't give too much of the oak profile. And you don't want to taste the oak, you want to taste all that fruitness that comes from each variety. All this, every variety apports something different to that wine and make it more. Uh, uh, you know, more, the merrier, the more various, the merrier. Um, it really it, it spends very few time aging, and that's very important for that type of wine. We want to keep it very fruity, and that's a very fruit forward wine, very old school style too. We have some acidity there because acidity is the glue that keeps all those varieties together. So that acidity gives you some brightness to the wine. And uh, after all, it's a very rounded wine with many different components that gives um, a very complex, but also interesting view of a blend. And I think it shows the, a little the story also of the Pedroncelli Sonoma County and a little the old wall style that come with them here. I'm very happy to make this wine. I think it's a very um, unpretentious wine, but also very, um, very friendly. And that's at the end of the day what you want, something that you can pair with any type of foods and any type of wines and an everyday drinker too. So I'm very looking forward to see Janet's uh, pairing with this wine. I think it, it really, it will show up very well just because of that, the versatility of this wine. So cheers. Uh, Monse, did you um, give the, the varieties that we have in the blend? Yes, I, it's a Merlot blend, a Merlot blend base. That's the main variety, but also got Syrah, uh, Sangiovese, that is a very Italian variety. Some yes. petit has seen some Sinfandel and some poor varieties, Quinta Madeira, Sozao, Quinta Cao. They're very small quantities right there, but the main three are those, Merlot, Syrah, and Sangiovese. Thank you. I, I love, once I love your wines in general because they're balanced. They're not um, over extracted. They're not overly alcoholic. They're not like, you know, too intense. And so they're, they were quite easy to pair with cheese. And the cheeses I chose for them are just like 
you know, the tip of the iceberg, I think so many types of cheeses would go with these wines because they are balanced and they have good acidity and they don't, you know, have, aren't, aren't overly tannic. Um, but we did, you know, I felt like we stepped up a little bit from the Merlot to this blend. We stepped up in terms of complexity, just kind of flavor, you know, yeah. interesting stuff going on. So I wanted to bump up the cheese a little bit too. So we're going to go to a more concentrated cheese with a lot more age on it. This is, um, of any of the four cheeses on our tray, this is probably the one that's closest to the, to uh, Monse's Manchego because this is 100% sheep milk. It's from France, just on the other side of the Pyrenees. I'm going to spell the name of it in the chat. It's um, also Irati. Also Irati. Um, so it, it is the classic French Basque cheese, cheap cheese. And sheep cheese is what they make in the Basque region primarily. And so this is like, everyone knows also Irati. There are many makers of it. Uh, it's a, it's what's, it's a, a PDO cheese, it's a, it's a cheese that has a protected name. So if you wanna make Osriarati, you have to make it within a defined zone. It's like an appellation for wine. You can't go outside of the zone for your milk or your processing. Uh, you have to make it in a certain way, certain size. Um, it's very controlled. And that the good thing about that is that it means that al almost every Osriarati you find is gonna be pretty similar to the other one. Uh, surely there are some, you know, uh, maybe one cheese got damaged in handling, you know, didn't, uh, the retailer didn't take very good care of it, or maybe one producer has slightly better milk sources, but they're very similar to Osloyerati, and I love them. They are kind of my desert island cheese, you know, if I had to uh, only have one cheese in my life for the rest of my life, it's these aged sheep cheeses that I love. I find them very savory. Um, very, uh, this, the, these French ones are very nutty and kind of, there's often a little caramel note and um, they love red wine, just love red wine. So this is, the, the rind on this one is what's called a natural rind as opposed to the first one, we, the, the um, Cabra La Mancha, that's a washed rind because they washed it with brine. They probably did a little washing on, on this one as well, but this is basically what was in the air that just settled on the, on the rind. So mm -hmm. it's, um, it's a it's drier, and I like to cut a triangle of this cheese. If I'm going to serve it to my guests, um, if I'm going to cut it, then I'm going to cut people a triangle like that. That's kind of the classic mm -hmm. way to serve it. So if you're making a um, antipasto platter and you want to cut the cheese for your guests, make these make these triangles. That's so everybody don't take the rind off. Everybody should get a little piece of the rind because yeah. that's. But the cheesemaker, that was the hardest part <laughs> to get that rind to form and the cheesemakers are proud of it. So even if you're not gonna eat it, let your guests cut it away. Mm. So this one too, I shaved. I, I, I hope you will do that. Take the back of your knife and scrape the surface and reveal, get rid of that kind of um, sheen. And wow, you're gonna get a caramel note, kind of a brown butter note more than anything. To me, it reminds me of brown butter, um, melting. Mm -hmm. Mm, very nutty, very silky, mm -hmm. creamy. Uh, could I type in the name? It's it is. I thought I did. It's uh, I did. It's there. Also, Irati. O s s a u hyphen i r a t y. Okay. If you has anybody been to the Basque region of, of France? In the past. Uh, Monse, have you been there? Mm -hmm. I've been in the Basque region, the Spain, but it's the Spanish part. You know, yeah, close, close enough. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you cross the mountains, <laughs> you're across in the um, Pyrenees. Across the Pyrenees, you're in the Basque region mm -hmm. of France, and the cheese is made on both sides of the mountains. On the French side and the Spanish side, are very similar. They're almost always 100% sheep's milk. The Spanish ones are a little more, a little more piquant, a little more peppery, and the French cheeses are a little more nutty, more a mellow. Mm -hmm. uh, what I find really interesting is that in France, if you go to that part of France and you have this cheese, they will serve it with um, a cherry, cherry preserves, a sour mm -hmm. cherry preserve. And then if you cross the Pyrenees and you go to just to the other side on the Spanish side, they're going to serve it with membrillo, uh, quince paste. 
Mm -hmm. So the idea in both cases is to serve this kind of salty, concentrated cheese with a, something that's a little bit sweet. And mm -hmm. uh, you might try that. You might try that at yeah. home. But how did it go with the red? How did it go um, with the classico? The classico is very smooth. I see someone say yes, and so yeah. is the cheese. So that's another pairing principle that I sometimes use is to kind of try to echo the texture. If you have a, mm -hmm. you know, a very silky, silky wine like this one is a very a creamy, silky cheese. Yeah. It's just a nice textural echo. Yeah, oh, and, and, even, and, the, and even this yeah. this cheese has a bit of what I call not quite, but close to the wine diamonds, or excuse me, cheese the diamonds that you find. I love that. I we used to call it wine diamonds when you find oh. you know, cartridges on your cork. But in cheese, and especially like aged Gouda or something like that, or some nice, beautiful Parmigiano, you know, you get those little crunchy bits. This is like almost before that it is what I'm finding. You get all the nuttiness that you're talking about, which is in that kind of nicely aged cheese, but you get, that's, to me, this is a very nice cheese to, to pair with, especially with red wines. I think if you, you white wines, you might be able to find maybe a, a fuller body Chardonnay with it, but yeah, Absolutely. with the Sonoma Classico, it's it's a really nice pairing. Yeah, the cheese of that region is a very robust red. Mm -hmm. uh, really, we never see it here, but um, it's a strong red. And I think um, your Cabernet is going to go very nicely with the also Irati as well. Can you all now see the name of the cheese in the chat? I typed it in again, so I hope you can see. Oh uh, yes. It. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. A good cheese counter will have it, but a Manchego or a Tuscan Pecorino mm -hmm. would be, you know, roughly similar. Yeah. This one's a little nuttier and, and more mellow. Mm -hmm. so, mm. What did you think of the pairing, Mom? Say, I think it's a great pairing. I think um, the aged part of the the aged part of the cheese matches very well with them the biggestness of, the, of this wine. This is a little more complex wine. And I think that um, uh, fattiness, it has some, some touch of fattiness in this wine. It combines very well with the small tannins. There's not much tannins, but they're there. And I think elevates each other. It doesn't, any of this wine or cheese uh, overpowers each other. I think they're complementing very well. And I think it's perfect, it's spot on. And it can go well with Cabernet too, definitely. Yeah, you bring up a good point. I don't know if it, uh, many of you noticed that on that um, Osirati, uh, as you brought it to room temperature, it started to glisten. It had kind of fat droplets on the surface. That's yes. very common with these sheep cheeses. They, they start to kind of sweat. And what they're giving up is not moisture. They're giving up fat. Um, sheep, uh, sheep, this is not, this cheese is not necessarily higher in fat than the cheddar that we're about to have, roughly the same. But that sheep milk, sheep milk is very high in fat and it tends to want to come out at room temperature, come out of the cheese. So that's what you're seeing. And um, it's a reason why uh, you don't want to take out of the fridge a whole lot more cheese than you're going to eat. So if, say you bought a half a pound of this cheese and it's just you for dinner. And so, you know, you're not going to eat a half a pound of cheese. You're going to eat a couple of ounces. Just take off, bring to room temperature what you think you're going to eat. Put the rest back and then you won't have that sweating because once it once that fat comes out it doesn't go back in and so you kind of you compromise the cheese a little bit if you take it in and out of the fridge mm -hmm. right well and the the beauty of any wine and food pairing of course and that's why cheese is such a favorite of mine is really the fat in most cheeses really kind of bridges that nice gap between, you know, the, the flavor and the depth of the wine, the structure of the wine and the acidity, the tannins and things like that. All of them work together really to come together as this beautiful pairing. And so that's, that's why cheese is one of my favorite things to pair with wine because it, the, the fat pretty much is there already and it just kind of provides that platform. Yeah. And the wine, you know, with its acidity and its tannin, it really kind of scrubs your palate clean. So it gets you ready for another taste. I think that's another reason why they're so, so pleasing together. So. All right, well, shall we move on to our final wine, which is our Cabernet Sauvignon, our Block 007. And it's a single vineyard. And I'll let uh, Wenceslas 
is poured her a little sample. Uh, we'll go ahead and taste it. Yeah, there it is. Our our block 007, the secret agent of our vineyard. <laughs> and I have to give my give a, a hats off to my dad, Jim. He's the one who, who added the zero. So we it was a block 07 and, and 007. So we've been joking all along that this is the James Bond of our Cabernet vineyards. <laughs> so Monse, go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you. So our last wine is our Cabernet Sauvignon uh, 007. Uh, it grows also in the valley floor of Dry Creek. Um, this, this wine is uh, made in a very characteristic trellis and gives it a, this specific uh, profile to this Cabernet. It's 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, it's a bigger Cabernet. You have um, a lot of blackberry. You got a lot of uh, minerality. You got uh, some uh, profile from the soil, from where it grows. It has a lot of uh, cooking herbs like oregano. I always catch oregano in this wine. Um, the, the oak treatment for this wine is about uh, 16 months in barrel, aging in barrel. It's a big wine, so it needs longer time staying in barrel to smooth those tannins. It's a big wine. And mm -hmm. um, I use always uh, French oak. Uh, with this uh, wine, and it's about a uh, forty percent, thirty-five percent, forty percent. It depends on the vintage um, new French oak barrels. Mm -hmm. That gives some mocha, some um, touch of vanilla, but very light. Again, we in Padron Chile, we always always want to show the variety. We don't want to show the oak. The oak is a second actor into or uh, wine making. We want to be a support in the wine, but no overpower in the wine. I think uh, it's gonna be interesting to taste this wine with the cheddar because it is a pairing that is very popular, cheddar and Cabernet Sauvignon. I think this wine has a very long finish when you finish drinking it. And wines that has a long finish need something to hold up to that. And I think a cheddar, an aged cheddar will do very great. I didn't taste it yet, but I'm pretty sure we're gonna nail that pairing because of that. So, mm -hmm. I think, um, again, we got some acidity. This is typical of Pedroncelli. We don't like to uh, let the grapes hang too long to lose that uh, varietal acidity. And that glues together and it shows as a brightness in the wine. So I'm ready to drink it. And if you wanna go ahead, Janet. Okay. Yeah, so we're, again, we're just ramping it up because now we have, we have tannin, we have backbone and structure and, all that we uh, love and expect from Cabernet Sauvignon. And uh, so I have bumped up the teas. We went, so we went from three days old to about three months old. Our last cheese was probably about six months old. And now we have a 14 month old cheddar. So what happens over all that time with a cheese like this cheddar is that you lose a lot of moisture. The cheese gets drier. And over that 14 months, so, you know, everything gets more concentrated. You know, it just, it doesn't, get, uh, uh, it doesn't get more salt, but it, we perceive a little more salty because we've lost moisture and we everything just gets more intense in a 14 month old cheddar. This is from Oregon, from a creamery called Face Rock. It's on the co coastal Southern Oregon, a town called Bandon. If anybody on the call is a golfer, you know of Bandon. I am not a golfer, but my two sisters are, and it is their fantasy to play this Bandon golf course. It's apparently one of the best golf courses in the world and most expensive. But really, to me, I know Bandon because it's dairy country. It is um, in Oregon, they call it the Banana Belt of Oregon. It's warmer than most of Oregon. Uh, of course, it rains a lot, so there's great pasture for cows, and it just has historically been dairy country since the 1800s. In fact, the town of Bandon, um, like in the late 1880s, there were uh, 10 or 12 creameries in the town, the dairies making cheese. And I found this a very interesting story. I hope we'll, I won't take up too much time in telling it, but I think it's a very interesting history that you know, the, all these families were making cheese in Bandon, and the town has burned down twice um, for the same reason. <laughs> it burned down in the early 1900s, and then it burned, they rebuilt it, and some of the cheesemakers came back. Um, and then it burned again, like in 1935, 36, and only one, only one cheesemaker came back. 
it burned because of this plant called gorse, G-O-R-S-E, which I'd never heard of before, but it's a, it came across to the West with the settlers. It's a shrubby, scrubby plant, and it is very flammable. It's full of oil. So there was lots of gorse around Bandon, and that's why they couldn't, either time they couldn't save the town. So after it burned the second time, only one cheesemaker came back, and it was the Bandon Cheese Factory. Well, in the, about uh, maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago, Tillamook bought the Band and Cheese Factory. Tillamook, oh. the big what, Oregon co-op. And they wow. ran it for about three years and then they closed it. They didn't just close it, they tore the building down. And it was an eyesore in Band and Everybody was so mad at Tillamook for doing that. And then about uh, maybe seven or eight years ago, um, a couple of developers got the idea to resuscitate that area with another cheese plant, another cheese factory. You know, they don't call it the Bandon Cheese Factory, they call it Face Rock, but they have brought cheese making back to Bandon. And in a wonderful turn of events, they have hired a cheese maker whose father, a generation ago, ran the Bandon Cheese Factory. So this young man grew up in Bandon. He has come back home after making cheese in Washington State, and he's making this beautiful cheddar. He's a cheddar expert. If any of you have had the wonderful cheddars from Washington State that Beecher makes, Beecher's flagship, yeah. Beecher's flagship reserve, yes. the man making this organ, this face rock cheddar, developed the recipes for Beecher. Award-winning wow. cheddars. Now he's back home in Oregon making face rock. Uh, this this um, bandaged cheddar, which means it was um, it was not aged in a bag. Maybe you've bought you bought cheddars at the supermarket that are cut into blocks, like rectangles. They don't have a rind. They're reasonably priced. Those are block cheddars and they're made in like 40 pound or 160 pound blocks, cut down. They're aged in bags and they don't get a rind. This cheese has a rind and that's a, it's a special, more artisan effort. And I love this cheddar because it's very, very mellow. It's not a, it's not super sharp or tangy. It's, he wants, he aims for a nuttier, more mellow style that I think is particularly harmonious with wine. So let's see what you think. Um, again, I scraped it with my knife. Mm -hmm. mm, super nutty. Mm -hmm. Nice tartness, nice acidity. You might get some crystals in your piece. The one that Julie was mentioning, those are protein crystals. It's not salt, it's not sugar, it's a little protein crystal. Right. It's considered a nice feature. I have just a mouthful of flavor, just like with the wine. So this piece really needs some, some strength. Imagine, now that you've got that wonderful cheddar in your mouth. No. And this is the cheddar, right? Yes. I try to give Somebody, you. Yeah. I want to mute well. yourself. Okay. I know. It's a very bold cheese for a very bold wine, I would say. It really matches the boldness of both. And they hold very well with the, end, the, the finish of the wine because it's a very long finish. It really, it, it was a great match, yes. Yeah. Yeah, if you imagine going back, you know, with this cheddar in your mouth, and then going back to the rosé, you, you see what I mean about need to line up intensity. You just know even without doing it that that would not be a very good match, that this cheese would really overwhelm that lovely rosé. Mm -hmm. So we need, you know, we need something with tannin and, mm -hmm. and to go with the strong cheese. Yeah, uh, that was a beautiful pairing. I mean, just, yep. uh, and it's so wonderful to know the, the history behind it. You know, because Beecher is one of our favorite, uh, you know, cheeses. And it's nice to know that this is now available. And yes, I mean, this is the, this is the beauty of discovery. We get to taste these cheeses, you get to taste them next to the wines, and you get to find out your favorite pairings. And, and uh, that's what, that's what this whole event was all about. It was just uh, really a discovery. Well, um, I have a question in the chat that I would love to answer because maybe other yes. people are wondering 
this call in the last couple of minutes we have. Someone once yes. asked, what makes a cheddar a cheddar? <laughs> And yes. it's a great question because there it is a, a, a cheddar. You know, we know there know there's a town in England called Cheddar, um, and but that's not that's really not um, it's not even where Cheddar originated. Close by, yes, but not in the town of Cheddar. And for the longest time, there wasn't even any Cheddar made in Cheddar. There is now. There's one creamery making Cheddar in Cheddar, but uh, Cheddar is a process. Uh, it's a it's a recipe, and it's very different from any other cheese. Uh, almost any other cheese, and you make it by uh, one thing you do is when you have your curd, um, your, you, you break up your curds and then you, you form them into a big square, like a big block of tofu, and you, st you stack those blocks on top of each other. So they're pressed by the weight of the stacks. And then you flip them and you let them, you know, the one on the bottom become the one on the top, and you, keep, you drain them very slowly by their own weight. And it's a way of slowly building up acidity. And that's why cheddars are often quite tart because they're trying, they want a lot of acidity. They're trying to build up acidity in that, in that cheese. And then when you've decided you've got enough acidity, you take those slabs of tofu and you feed them through a mill, like a food mill, like a meat grinder. And you make very, very fine curds. There, you don't do that with other cheeses. So that's why you get that kind of crumbly texture um, with cheddars where they kind of, it kind of breaks up into into chunks is because of that milling process so it's, it's a it's a very different process and that's what makes cheddar cheddar thank you thank you uh, now if anybody else i know some some of you have been typing in questions on the chat bar but if you have any you can unmute yourselves and uh let janet or Monse know if you have any questions for them uh, this would be a good time to do that, unless there's any other things to add. I'd love to know what cheeses people like best. Did you have a favorite cheese? You can move it into the chat or just... There's yeah. That. Hey, we like the face rock, <laughs> but we're from, you know, we're from Oregon. But I love um, the crumbliness and the tenderness of it with the cab. I just thought it was just beautiful. But then I go back to... You know, we, we each one had its own flavor. I think it's been fun to kind of mix and match it with each, like we'll try one and then we'll try the wines and then we'll kind of kind of go back and forth with them to see, but it's been wonderful. Both the wines and the cheese are great. So thanks. Thank you. Good. Thank you. And I think I saw somebody say they like the uh, Meredith Dairy Best. Best was the number one. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very popular cheese. It's hard not to like it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's that touch of cheese. Else I do with it. Um, excuse me, Julie. I was just going to say oh. that um, now that we're getting into pesto, it's almost pesto season. Mm -hmm. um, with summer coming, I put a little chunk of that cheese in my pesto, and it makes mm -hmm. my homemade pesto. And it oh, you can do store bought pesto, and it makes it really creamy, and it gives your pesto just a little bit of tang and a wonderful creaminess. That's a great idea. Good. My comment, if I may. Uh, yes. I always like to say that wine always tastes better with cheese and cheese always tastes better with wine. And that's what I follow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great wisdom. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> there's an old saying, there's an old saying in the business, in the wine business, uh, merchants would say that you buy on apples and you sell on cheese. And yeah. what that means, if you think about it, is that if you're the wine merchant and you're trying to make some buying decisions, you know, what cheeses should, what wine should you sell, you buy on apples. You, put, you eat an apple because it cleans your palate and you're going to make a good buying decision. But you sell on cheese because yeah. if you give people a little piece of cheese, they just, you know, they want that some wine. It makes wine taste better. Yeah. I have a yeah. quick question. Um, between the 007 and like the wisdom, Help me understand kind of those, like uh, what's, what's the difference from a winemaking perspective? Um, how would you add that to kind of your wine portfolio? So just help us understand those differences, if you could. So thank you. The difference between the 007 and the wisdom is the location, they're in different parts of the valley, but also the, the vine itself. The, the, as I said, the 007 is, uh, Clone number seven, um, 
that it grows in a different type of trellis. And the wisdom is a clone number four. Every clone in, in Cabernet gives you a different profile on the grapes. Clone number four is an Argentinian clone. And it gives very, very few clusters per vine. The few clusters, the more concentration of flavors. The clone number seven gives you a lot of clusters. So you got a little more dilution there of the flavors. It is more concentrated, the wisdom, than the 007. Is, therefore, this is bigger. And because it's bigger, I have to give him a little more oak treatment to hold up that body that he has, that it has. And so it has longer time in barrel. He stays 18 months in barrel versus the 16 of the mm -hmm. 007. And it has a little more oak and a little higher profile oak. It's a 40% versus a 30%. And it, I use thin staves. That is the only wine that I use for the wisdom, thin staves, because the EHS it spe it speeds up the aging of the wine. So it's a very big wine compared one to the other. But it's they're both very um, huge personalities. And it matches different flavors and tastes from different people. Yeah, I hope thank you. I hope I know that. Perfect. Question. Thank you so much. So, Amy, there's there's a real easy way to think about the two different wines. Yeah, I like to I like to think about them as cuts of beef, because okay. Pedrinelli wines are built for beef. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, well. So if you're th if you're thinking about the 007, you're thinking about maybe like a ribeye cut, because yeah. the minute you pick up the glass and you smell it, you know it's Cabernet. If you pick up a piece of ribeye in your mouth, you know it's beef. There's no question. And if you're a ribeye lover, you love beef fat. You yeah. love the flavor of beef. To me, the wisdom is the filet mignon of mm. the world because it is the most integrated flavor. It, it's all about not only the texture of the meat and the flavor of the meat, but it's everything that goes around that steak. And I have had this wisdom cabernet that Monse makes in all sorts of different settings. And no matter the setting, that wine just immediately fits. So to me, that's what a filet mignon does. It's, it's just, it's not only about the beef, it's about everything around the beef. So just think about the two different cuts of beef and that's how you can tell the difference. Works for me, Ed, thank you, that's great. Is anybody else? This I love that we're in the heart of Pinot country and we love Pedrincelli. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we love that you love us. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Hi, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, Marianne. I'm not, uh, I'm not very well versed at this, but um, just back to the very beginning, you had talked about the rosé that we tasted and I was just curious that you said um the rosé needs to be tamed mm -hmm. um you use a Zinfandel and the rosé is a tamer so so why do you use the Zinfandel grape to tame it down to make a rosé uh we Does make, make our yes thank you <laughs> Um, this is the answer. <laughs> no problem. This is the answer. Um, we may, it's a, like Julie said, it's a tradition to make a uh, rosé made of Zinfandel grapes. And when I say that I need to tame it, it's because Zinfandel grapes are uh, a grapes that produce a lot of sugar. They want to be big and they have a lot of color. So trying to make a rosé wine out of those grapes is really hard. That's what I say. I try to tame. So I try to pick those grapes very early so I don't get as much color and make it very pale, as you can see. And I have no, no much alcohol because I believe a rosé doesn't need to have a lot of alcohol. It needs to be fresh, it needs to be very fruity. So when I use the word taming, it's just a way to say, it's a great, it's a big grape and I wanna make it light. That's all I'm trying to do when I make the rosé. And I'm working with a grape that makes big wines like Zinfandel. And make a from that a rosé is really hard work, and it, it it makes a lot. You need to make a lot of steps to make it very light and very light color, and very low alcohol. And that's all the taming is about. It's a wild grape. Simpanel is wild, and we need to tame it. Right. That's pretty much it. <laughs> okay, thank you. I love I love Zinfandel. I, I just, thank you. 
I was just curious why you <laughs> why love, you would do something so strong. To, and we love Petroncelli. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And been drinking your wines for a very long time. I used to stay at your winery. I introduced Petroncelli to the East Coast probably ah. about 30, 30 years ago in the wine business. Wow. And I stayed at I stayed at your winery. I think I dealt with John. I stayed at your winery for a week at your guest home that you had on the property, right down the street from yeah. your right, right street. Oh, okay. And yes. we were just welcome back. We, we were just out there in October, my wife and I, and my uh, my daughter, her husband, and my grandchild for a week. And Petra and Charlie was like at the top of the list. This is where we have to go. This is where Daddy got his start. So and, where? Where did you uh, where did you sell the wine? Uh, I I I was working for a company called Fedway Associates in New Never Jersey. Heard of those guys. No. <laughs> no. Come on, they, yes. go, they go way back. <laughs> way back. I worked I worked for their offshoot, Perone. Yeah. We, we dealt with a lot of the uh, boutique wineries, which I consider Petroncelli yeah. as a one for our boutique wineries that we dealt with. Yeah. Right. Wow. So. For all those for all those joining in on the shop talk here, uh, Fedway is in New Jersey. Yes. So as you can imagine, just a small market in the in the <laughs> national market. We live in Pennsylvania, so we don't get to visit often, but but we do enjoy your wines often. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you, and thank you for the thank story. You. It is much appreciated. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Well, are we ready to go into the evening? And uh, we'll end our, our little note here. If anybody has anything else to add, Monse or Janet or anybody else will. Uh, <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, got do I get my chocolates tea. now? <laughs> <laughs> now it's time for chocolate. <laughs> Is it time for my chocolate nibs from Pedro and Chelly? <laughs> What do I drink those with? <laughs> you came with props. I do I drink my, with my port or what? <laughs> <laughs> port is best, but you know what? Cabernet is pretty good with chocolate. Okay, too. good. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I think chocolate is really good with chocolate. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Appreciate it. It was so, great. And for, for those of you who are coming our direction, we would love to have you come visit us. Please feel free to send uh, Julie or me and uh, an email and it's really, really complicated to get in touch with us. It's either Julie at Petroncelli.com or Ed at Petroncelli.com. Oh, that's complicated. Uh, we would love to have you come and visit. We'll sit out on the bocce deck and drink wine. And I promise not to tell you the 17 finer, port, finer points of Petroncelli wines. We'll just sit around and talk about neighbors we shouldn't talk about anymore. There you go. <laughs> so, Cheers. our cellar door is open. Thank you, Janet for My this pleasure. wonderful evening. Thank you, Monse, for joining us and talking about the wines. It was a wonderful evening. And uh, thank you all for joining us. And I uh, look forward to another chance to talk about wine and food, wine and cheese, wine and any other iteration that we could think of. So cheers to everybody. My glass is cheers. empty, so I need to go fill it up. Cheers. But I hope you enjoyed it all. And again, thank you so much. Cheers. 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 Salute day. <laughs> <laughs>